Let us pray. For God, we pray that you may grant us wisdom, grant us knowledge, and grant us understanding that your word that is set before us today will be interpreted accurately, applied appropriately, and will bring forth the fruit of everlasting life. So God, we pray that you may speak to us in this hour a word of life, a word of hope, a word that will sustain us in the days ahead. Let your word come unto us now with clarity. Let the words of my mouth and the reflections of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Brothers and sisters, for three consecutive Sundays, we have been confronted with the reality of resurrection. I am not sure if you are anywhere closer to being able to fully grasp the significance and the meaning of resurrection. It took the disciples a long time to reach that place. Even though they were confronted with resurrection again and again, it took them a very long time and many appearances for them to fully understand the meaning and the significance of resurrection. On that morning that Jesus was raised from the dead, the woman had gone to the tomb early in the morning, unsure that they were going to get access to the grave, to the tomb, because of a large stone that was placed against the entrance. When they got there, however, the stone had been removed. And they were given a message by an angel that the one that they were looking for, Jesus of Nazareth, was not there because he had been raised from the dead. They were overwhelmed. They were in disbelief. One gospel tells us that they went away and they said nothing. Another gospel tells us that while the other woman left, that Mary remained there and she had the opportunity to experience, to encounter Jesus. Because she was there weeping and she saw a man she thought was a gardener. When she inquired from him where they had taken the body, Jesus called her by name, and she recognized him. She went back and told the others that Jesus had been raised. At least two of the disciples ran to the tomb and went and saw it just as a woman had said, but they too left unsure, unsure what to make of the empty tomb. Then we are told by John that Jesus appeared before the disciples while they were in a locked room. Thomas was not there. Jesus showed them his hands, his side, and his feet. And they saw him. One week later, Thomas was there and Jesus again appeared 
before them again, the room was locked. And Thomas, who had not had the experience the week before, when he saw Jesus, cried, My Lord and my God. But the disciples still did not know what to make of resurrection. They still were not sure what this meant for their daily life. They still wasn't sure how this was going to change their lives. They still were not sure what they should make of it in terms of faith and relationship with God. So much so that Peter encouraged the others and said, let's go back to what we knew. And they went fishing. Jesus again appeared to them while they were fishing. Having toiled all night and caught nothing, Jesus, standing on the beach, said to them, cast your net on the right side. And they did, and great was the catch. And one of them recognized that it was Jesus and said to the others, it's the Lord. Even then, they still had no idea what to make of resurrection. It has been several weeks now that they had seen the risen Christ. Several weeks now since they had touched him, since they had breakfast with him. Several weeks now since he had been among them, appearing and disappearing. And we come again today to another text where again the risen Lord appears to the disciples and they're still not sure what to make of resurrection. So for them, it took several weeks to discover, to discern, to realize what resurrection meant for them in their daily life and living. According to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, we are presented with what I would want to call some implications of resurrection. Because indeed, as the disciples would later learn, resurrection has implications. Resurrection affects our life and our living. Resurrection affects uh, how we relate to each other, and how we relate to the world. Resurrection certainly affects how we relate with the divine. And so allow me to posit at least three implications of resurrection. There are many more. But allow me today to simply dwell briefly on three implications of resurrection. The first is in Acts chapter 3 and verse 12. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, you, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? It's an interesting story in Acts of the Apostles. <coughs> the disciples of Jesus operating in the power of the resurrection had made a man that was lame to walk. <coughs> they were able, through the power of the resurrection, to give new life, new hope to a hopeless situation. This was not the first. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, wherever the disciples were, people were experiencing the power of the resurrection. People who were lame were walking. People who were blind were receiving their vision. People who were deaf were hearing. People who had diseases were being made free. 
people who are crippled, were experiencing new life. Because the power of the resurrection was causing situations to change. The power of the resurrection was at work in impossible situations, making them possible. It is the Apostle Paul who tells us that the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that is at work in us. Hear me, my brothers and sisters. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that is at work in us and through us. Therefore, what the early church was experiencing was the power of the resurrection making people whole, turning impossible situations into possibility, making that which can't be done doable, making that which is unheard of possible. The power of the resurrection was at work in and through the apostles. This is only one implication of the resurrection. That seemingly impossible situations become possible because the same spirit that roused Jesus from the dead the same spirit that broke open the tomb, the same spirit that called Jesus from death to life, is the same spirit that is ministering amongst us. Therefore, it says to us that the implication of resurrection is that there is hope in our hopeless situations. The implication of resurrection is that a story is not done until God says amen. The implication of resurrection is that God has the final word. The implication of resurrection is that God is able to do more than we can ask or imagine. The implication of resurrection is that dead things can still come to life. The implication of resurrection is that sickness can be healed. The implication of resurrection is that God can turn a situation upside down. The implication of resurrection is that when the world says it can't be done, God says it can be done. The implication of resurrection is that when man says it is finished, God says it is just beginning. My brothers and sisters, resurrection has implications for how we live our daily life. It means that because we are children of the resurrection, that we live triumphantly. Because we are children of the resurrection, we live with eternal hope. Because we are children of the resurrection, we live believing and keeping an eye for the impossible. Because we are children of resurrection, we recognize there is hope. I once heard this story, I'm not sure if it's true, of this man who was convicted of murder. 
even though there was no body. But there was enough proof that he had participated in a murder, the murder of this particular individual. And his attorney did his best to argue a case for him to be considered innocent. And after he had tried everything and had failed, he now only had his closing remarks. And the attorney started his closing remark by saying, and called the individual name and said that the person is not dead, but is alive. And therefore, you cannot charge my client for the murder of someone who is alive. And he pointed to the door and he says, I bet you that in a minute, he is going to walk through that door. And everyone from the jury turned their attention to the door, and waited for the minute and there was nothing. And he said, the fact that you turned and looked means that you believe that somehow there is reasonable doubt that a person could be alive. And the members of the jury went to deliberate. And in less than half an hour, they returned with a guilty verdict. The attorney was livid. He said, how could you return a guilty verdict when you looked expecting the dead person to walk into the room? The lead member of the jury said, sir, you're right. We all looked with the hope that the individual will walk through the door. The only problem with that is that your client never lifted his head. Your client never expected the person to walk through. Isn't that our reality with resurrection? Isn't that our reality with resurrection? That we do not experience the power of resurrection because we do not expect the power of resurrection. Isn't that the reality? Why we do not experience more healing and deliverance? Could it be that's the reason why we are not freed from our entombed situations? Could it be that it is because we do not expect the power of resurrection to be available to us in that day because as far as we are concerned, resurrection is a historical fact that happened thousands of years ago but has no implications for our life today, our daily life. And so we do not lift our faith because we do not expect a breakthrough. Could it be that we do not expect the implication of resurrection to be the power of God at work in our lives? The second implication of resurrection is in verse 13. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. The second implication of resurrection is the glory of Jesus in us. The glory of Jesus in us. 
the writer points to the glory of Jesus. And I particularly like the way that First John puts it. See what love the Father has given unto us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Hear this. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we will be has not yet been revealed. But what we know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. The glorious resurrection of Jesus ought to be reflected in our daily life and living. This tells us, brothers and sisters, that because of resurrection, we have potential. Because of resurrection, we have the potential to become like Jesus. Because of resurrection, we have been injected with the seed of eternity. Because of resurrection, we have imprinted in us the glory of God. What this says to me, therefore, is that even though our world is so messed up, and even though the Bible tells us that we are all sinners, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, even though we are fallible, even though we make mistakes, even though we mess up, and we mess up very badly, even though we have brokenness and broken relationships, resurrection tells us that we have the potential for good. Resurrection tells us that we have the potential for beauty. Resurrection tells me that I have the potential to be good, that I have the potential to become all that God has created me to become, that is to be like Jesus. Resurrection tells me that there is goodness in our world and that our world can be good. Resurrection tells me that instead of me expecting people to be nasty and brutish, that resurrection tells me that I can expect that they can become good and decent. Resurrection tells me that instead of expecting people to be corrupt, that I can expect that people are going to operate above board. Resurrection tells me that I can expect that our world can become just. Resurrection tells me that there is the potential in every person to be good. Resurrection tells me that our world doesn't have to be riddled with wars and rumors of wars, but our world can experience love and peace. Resurrection tells me that what's happening in the Middle East now doesn't have to continue. Resurrection tells me that somebody can make an intelligent decision now that I am going to put an end to all of this nonsense of destroying life. Resurrection tells me that as bad as things look, that things can change in a twinkling of an eye because each of us have an imprint of the glory of God waiting to shine forth, waiting to burst out. Resurrection tells me that people who have been nasty all their lives can be good. Resurrection tells me that people who are constantly telling lies can tell truth. Resurrection tells me that people can change. Resurrection tells me that our world can change. Resurrection tells me that I can live instead of being pessimistic, that I can become optimistic. Resurrection tells me, my brothers and sisters, that things do not have to remain the way they are because the glory of God 
is at work and waiting to shine forth. So each of us has a print of eternity in us. Oh, how I love the way that John puts it. John says, you know what you are now, but you don't know what you're becoming. But this one thing you know, that you will be like him. Revelation paints a beautiful picture of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on his throne, reigning over heaven and earth. Resurrection paints a picture of Jesus in his majesty. And here John is saying to you and to me that you will be like him. You will be like him. Not only in the future, but now. Third and finally, resurrection demands resurrection, um, repentance. Resurrection demands repentance. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Repent, therefore, and turn to God. I find it interesting that Jesus only appeared, according to Scripture, to people who he had a relationship with. Jesus, according to Scripture, did not appear to Pilate, nor Herod, nor the soldiers who crucified him, nor the crowd who shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus appeared to those he had a relationship with. This says to me that resurrection demands repentance. Resurrection demands relationship. Resurrection demands that I turn away from myself, that I turn away from my sin, and I turn my life over to God fully and totally. Resurrection says to me that the only way you can experience resurrection is in relationship with God. Resurrection says, that the only way that you can experience resurrection is through repentance and the forgiveness of sin. Therefore means that resurrection only makes sense for people who love God. Resurrection only makes sense for people who have a relationship with the Lord. Resurrection only makes sense for people who desire to become all that God has created them to be. Resurrection makes no sense to the person who has turned away from the Lord. Resurrection makes no sense to the one who has denied the re- um, that Jesus lived and died and was raised. Resurrection only makes sense in relationship. And that is why the people who experience resurrection are the people who had relationship. We think, for example, of Peter. Jesus called Peter aside. Peter, do you love me more than these? Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me more than these? Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter was hurt. Lord, you know all things. And you know that I love you. You know what the Lord was doing? The Lord was bringing Peter back to a place of relationship. Peter had become estranged. Peter could not fully grasp the fullness of resurrection. 
Peter could not fully comprehend the power of resurrection. And so the Lord called him back into relationship. Brother, sister, could it be the reason why we are not experiencing the fullness of resurrection is because we are estranged from God? Could it be that it is because our prayer life is weak or non-existent? Could it be that we have not experienced the fullness of resurrection? Is because we are not fully surrendered? Could it be that we are not experienced the fullness of resurrection because we have never fully given our lives to the Lord? Could it be that we have not fully experienced resurrection because we are worshiping from a distance and we have not drawn an eye near to experience his warm embrace, his love? Brothers and sisters, there are implications for resurrection. Resurrection is not something that just happened thousands of years ago. Resurrection has implications for today, for now. Resurrection can be manifested in your life now as God draws you near to him and heals you or gives you the grace to bear a season of pain and distress and agony. Resurrection has implications for how we carry life, for how we carry our crosses. Resurrection has implications for when we find ourselves entombed by life, trapped by situations, trapped by our unbelief, entombed by our pain, our anxiety, our fear. Resurrection has implications for how we organize our daily life. Resurrection has implications for how we raise our children. Resurrection has implications for how we participate in community life. Resurrection has implications for our everyday living. I invite you now, come, experience resurrection afresh. Come, Experience the implications of resurrection in your life.